Hi, and welcome back to Trust the Bible. Last time we looked at some of the Old Testament manuscripts. How did we have what the Old Testament authors uh, wrote? How did we have that handed down over the centuries so that we would have something that, that we could look at that would tell us what was in those original writings uh, that we could make English translations from. Uh, now we're going to focus more on the New Testament, and that has a whole other story of, of how we got the New Testament. Uh, the New Testament books 27, starting with Matthew, are all written, of course, after Jesus' death and resurrection uh, because uh, they are about what Jesus did and what the apostles are teaching. So let's talk first of all about the manuscripts. We looked at autographs last time. The autographs would be what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what, what was actually written in their handwriting. We don't have those. What we have is uh, copies of those. People hand wrote copies of those autographs and, and those are manuscripts. And people took the manuscripts and made handwritten copies of them. And so uh, what we have are those copies that we base our New Testament from today. Uh, here's something that we need to know right out of uh, out of the gate. There are 400,000 different variations. When I say variation, I mean that if you take a Greek manuscript of the New Testament and you compare it with a second different manuscript of the Greek New Testament, you're going to find differences. Every single difference will be a variant. If there's a word order switched around in two verses, that's a variant. If there is a spelling change, that's a variant. If uh, there's a, a different verse or a word left out or a word put in, all of those are variants. There are over 400,000 variants in the New Testament. And so critics will seize on this and say, see, the New Testament, we can't trust the text. There's so many differences in the manuscripts. Well, not so fast. Um, and, and this does break down to, just by the way, an average of two variations for every word in the New Testament. So that sounds bad, right? That sounds like we don't really have any idea what was in the original New Testament uh, writings, the, the ones that the apostles or those closely associated with them uh, physically wrote down in their own handwriting. Um, that's our starting point. And what we're going to find is that this is really not... Uh, nearly as big of a deal as it sounds at first. We actually have very accurate recordings of our New Testament scriptures. One of the issues is that we have so many manuscripts of the New Testament and that helps us to compare them in order to know with great certainty what were in the originals, what the autographs stated. Um, but also when you have so many manuscripts, every single manuscript could have a, some differences and those add up and so that 400,000 is a total of all the thousands of manuscripts studied create all these variants um, but uh, for the most part uh, as we're going to see it, it's really not an issue for us to to be concerned about all right no two manuscript copies are the same so there are thousands of Greek manuscripts of the New Testament when you compare them side by side these handwritten copies that date from many, many centuries ago, no two are identical. There's, there's at least a spelling change or something is somewhat different. And so that's, that's just the nature of what we're working with when we're working with these copies. Uh, there are 5,700 Greek manuscripts and thousands more in other languages. So the New Testament was written in Greek and uh, there are 5,700 manuscripts, which means, you know, pre-printing press, handwritten copies that are very old. We have all these manuscripts. I mean, you think about going through 5,700 different manuscripts. That would be an incredible task. Uh, you know, just think of how long it takes to read through the New Testament in English once. Imagine going through thousands uh, of these copies, and we can compare them all and categorize them and... Uh, use computers today to analyze you know, every verse uh, quite easily. Um, but that's just Greek manuscripts. Then you, you can find ancient copies that are you know, 1,500 years old um, in Latin. And there are, there are over 20,000 Latin manuscripts and other languages that also we can study to compare and see what were in the original manuscripts. 
All right, here's one example of a Greek manuscript. This is written on papyrus. This is actually a, uh, facil uh, a replica of uh, the Greek manuscript known as P52. That stands for papyrus 52. It's the 50 second papyrus or numbered papyrus that was found with New Testament writing on it. I keep a copy of this in my office. This is a, a picture of that. Uh, I, I love this because you can actually see the writing. This dates back to, some have said, 100 AD, which would be within 10 years, or, or possibly within 10 years, depending on when you date John, could be within 10 years of when John actually wrote the Gospel of John. This is obviously just a very small fragment of the Gospel of John. There are two pieces. You can see that they're mirror images of each other. You could lay one on top of the other behind. That's because this is the front side on the left and the back side on the right. And this is a replica. So, you know, the original, you would have to walk around to see the back side. But, but here are uh, two replicas. You can see the front and the back side by side. And they contain a portion of John chapter 19 and 20. Now, it's not very impressive in the sense of, of containing a copy of all of the Gospel of John, but it contains enough words here for us to compare and see, oh, this copy that dates so far back has the same wording for John as other copies that come much, much later. Um, and so it shows us the accuracy that we have a very early copy of John. Uh, more recently, some scholars have dated this as late as 200 AD, but at any rate, this is one of the earliest, if not the earliest, uh, manuscript we have of New Testament writing and you can tell you get these manuscripts you've got to work to uh, just transcribe what Greek letters there are there and figure out what portion of scripture it's copying obviously later copies are more complete uh, would include whole books of the New Testament this is a a fragment of part of the book of John all right let's talk about some of the differences in the manuscripts and I'm going to start right off into uh, a King James verse. There are differences between the King James and the NIV and other modern translations, not simply because of the style of the language. King James, of course, is written in an older English. Uh, NIV is a more modern English, but that's not the only reason for some of the differences in translation, as we'll see. Here's an example, Matthew 9, 13. But go ye and learn what that meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And let's focus on that last part. Jesus says he has not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Matthew 9, 13 in the NIV, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, in both the King James and the NIV, they're using the exact same text that's just a difference in the style of English right up until that very last part. Notice that the King James says uh, to repentance, whereas uh, the um, NIV says, but sinners, and that word repentance is not there. That's because repentance is not in some of the later or some of the earlier i should say some of the earlier manuscripts we have of matthew now that i i know if, if you're not familiar with this you might have some questions in fact some people will argue that christians should only use the king james i'll talk more about this in the next video uh, we should only use the king james because look the niv has repentance missing and at first glance, you might think, oh, the NIV translators removed the word repentance because they want to be more politically correct or something. They want that, you know, the, the word repentance is something that they want to get rid of. Um, and so if we want accurate Bible reading, we need the King James. That would be the argument for the King James, um, those who argue that that's the only translation you should use. I would say, hold on just a moment. Both the King James and the NIV are based on Greek manuscripts, copies. They are based on different copies. And I believe the NIV, and we'll, we'll talk about this when we talk about translations next time, I believe the NIV is based on a, a larger number of manuscripts. We have found so many more older uh, manuscripts since the time the King James was translated 
that we now have a much better idea uh, and can more accurately determine that the words to repentance weren't in the original. Somewhere along the line, those words got added into a later manuscript that was used by the King James translators. Now, you say, well, that's bad. Like, like was the word repentance in there or not? Doesn't that change uh, the meaning of the Bible? Not really, because notice in Luke 5.32 in the NIV, it's, Jesus is quoted there as well in Luke, and, and Jesus says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. In other words, Luke gives his version of what Jesus said, and Luke includes the words to repentance. The NIV includes it there. Why? Because we know that it was in the original manuscripts there. It wasn't in the original manuscripts in Matthew 9, 13. What probably happened is, is a copier, uh, a, someone writing Matthew, knew Luke 5.32 in his mind that Jesus came to call not the righteous but sinners to repentance and he simply added that to Matthew's version because in his mind he was thinking about those words but earlier manuscripts the closer to the original don't say to repentance so the NIV isn't trying to get rid of the words repentance uh, uh, to repentance there the NIV includes it in Luke the NIV is trying to be accurate to what we know the original autographs would have contained. The King James translators didn't have access to um, so many of the manuscripts that we have today. So today we have a more accurate Greek text than we had even 50 years ago, but especially more so than uh, 400 years ago. All right, so that's just one example of how that would be a variant. Is repentance there in Matthew 9, 13 or not? But it doesn't change our understanding that Jesus came not to call the righteous but sinners. It doesn't even change the meaning that Jesus came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. It's just not in Matthew 9.13. It's only in Luke 5.32. Um, so these are the kind of things that can come up in differences between the manuscripts. These differences do not change any of our meanings of what the New Testament teaches in any um, way that should be bothering to us as Christians. It just is simply a matter of comparing manuscripts, studying, and, and making a determination as to what the original Greek texts um, said. Because again, it's the autographs that are inspired by God. That doesn't mean every manuscript is inspired by God. The collection of manuscripts help us get a very accurate understanding of what was in the autographs. All right, let's talk more about these manuscripts. Most of the differences of all these thousands and thousands of differences, they're meaningless variations in spelling or word, or word order. They don't change anything at all about the meaning at all. It's just a word order or a spelling change. Um, that's the vast majority of these thousands of variants. Uh, most of the others, the small percentage uh, of other variants that don't deal with something as meaningless as that, are not viable, meaning although they are differences, they're unique to some later manuscript, or we can tell that they clearly are uh, mistakes that a copyist made. I mean, I mean, out of all these thousands of copies, of course, mistakes are going to be made. We can often very easily tell, oh, this is this one copy made this mistake. It's not viable, meaning it's not something that's even open to debate as to what was in the original text. It, it's not anything that we need to be concerned about. Um, only 1% of these variants actually affect the meaning of a verse in some way, like the example I just gave you, um, and there's some question as to what the original text meant. Now, by some question, I mean you could theoretically imagine that the original might have been one way or the other, but even in these cases, we have... Um, we, we know what the original said to a very high degree of certainty, just not, not complete certainty. So of these, careful textual analysis gives great evidence of what the original text is. So in other words, even though there might be some possible questionable interpretation or, or a question about what the original text says, it's very minor. It's only a, a small amount of doubt. Uh, we, we have great certainty um, as to what the original text said in, in almost all of these cases. All right, the end of Mark and John's account of the woman brought to Jesus to be stoned would be too 
sort of exceptions to what I just said. In other words, generally we know what the original text said and it's not very meaningful even if there was a difference. Mark and John's account are a little bit more controversial. Mark ends with a description of Jesus saying that his followers will be able to um, pick up poisonous snakes and not be harmed. Um, they'll be able to uh, cast out demons. They'll be able to do all kinds of things Jesus describes there. And here's the thing. That's in the King James. The ending of Mark is in the King James. That ending is not included in some of modern translations. Now that's a meaningful difference because uh, there are some churches today, especially in charismatic circles, that will have people walk among poisonous snakes just to prove Mark 16 is true. It's not a core issue to the Christian faith because even if we assume that Mark 16 should be included in Mark and, and those verses should be included, it doesn't mean that all of us should test God and walk with poisonous snakes today. That's not uh, the only meaning. I don't even think that's a reasonable interpretation of that text. Uh, what that text is saying is that some believers would be able to do that. And indeed, we know from the book of Acts that Paul, for instance, was bitten by a poisonous snake and he was not harmed. And so that prophecy was fulfilled by Paul. It doesn't need to be fulfilled by me or anyone else today. Uh, but what we can deduce from studying the manuscripts is that that wasn't even originally a part of Mar Mark's gospel anyway. And we have a high degree of certainty of that. Even if scholars are wrong, and it was originally part of Mark's gospel, which we know with almost certainty it was not, it still doesn't really affect any teaching that should be around in the church today. It's not something about a core doctrine. It's not something that um, can't be interpreted in, in various ways. It's not saying that people need to walk around poisonous snakes. Uh, the woman caught in adultery where Jesus says, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. That's a very popular Bible passage. It may indeed be something Jesus said. It might be an early tradition about Jesus that was accurate. It wasn't part of John's original writing of John's gospel. And we know that with a great deal of certainty. Maybe John wrote it in another writing and later on it got included in John's gospel in a manuscript, um, but we don't know. All we know is that it was not part of John's original gospel, and therefore I think that calls the story into some question. Um, that is probably the most significant example in all of the New Testament where there is uh, some question about a story that's commonly told, accepted, loved. But even if we take that out of the Bible, does that mean that Jesus is not compassionate or loving or had concern for sinners? No, it doesn't really change our view of Jesus. It's not a, a significant teaching. It's just a story we like, and it may very well be true, but we know from studying the manuscripts that it is almost certainly not part of John's original gospel. All right? Most of the examples that are viable. In other words, we, we, are, we have some question about them. I wouldn't even include Mark and John, but there are other examples where there are some questions about what was in the original text. They affect meaning in some way, but it's not very meaningful, not very significant. Romans 5.1 is a good example. Some early New Testament manuscripts say, we have peace with God. Others say, let us have peace with God. It's a difference of a letter in Greek one letter. Um, so is Paul writing, hey, we should have peace with God, ex exhorting us, calling on us to have peace with God? Or is he celebrating the fact that we have peace with God? Well, I can tell you either way, we know from the New Testament and other places that, that we do have peace with God through Jesus Christ. We, we know that from other verses. And we know that we should seek to or, or um, want to have peace with God, meaning we need to get saved. We need to believe in Jesus so that we have peace with with God and believers should keep that in mind and be thoughtful about how Jesus has won our peace with God. So either way, it doesn't change any teachings of, of the Christian faith. It's just a very small difference um, where there is some uncertainty about what the original Greek text says. Um, compared to all other ancient literature, the New Testament is by far the best supported. I, I want to really emphasize this. 
if you're a little bothered by, hey, we don't know for certain what some of the original writings of the New Testament said, know that by and large, we do have a very accurate understanding of the New Testament. It's just very minor examples like the ones that I've brought up um, where there is some debate and even there the meaning doesn't really get impacted very much. That's is not true of other ancient literature. Most other ancient texts, we're, we're relying on a very relatively few number of manuscripts and there could be a great deal of difference between what we have today and what the original writings had um, because we don't have the evidence that we have for the New Testament. Um, so there are 124 New Testament manuscripts that date within 300 years of the originals. That is unheard of when it comes to other ancient writings like uh, Homer and the Odyssey and the Iliad or Roman historians uh, writings like Tacitus, uh, Josephus, um, many other ancient writings, um, Herodotus, the Greek historian. We just don't have copies that date that close. They come much, much later, and so we don't really know with certainty what those early, uh, what the original texts actually said. Um, another thing to know is that all variants in the New Testament combined add less than 2% to the original text. Less than 2%. That's words like in the King James uh, that later text the King James is based on adds to repentance because that's in, in another gospel in Luke. Um, and so over time, as more manuscripts are done, you would expect that a few accidental additions like that are going to be made. Another example is that some of the earlier manuscripts often referring to Jesus, we see over time later manuscripts start referring to Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of references are made to Jesus Christ even in the earliest manuscripts. What I'm saying is that whereas uh, you know, many of them were just to Jesus, uh, you, you see an increase in the number of times that Jesus, the word Christ, is added to the end of Jesus. Why? Because as Christians are thinking about Jesus Christ in their mind and they're copying a text that says Jesus, it makes sense why they might accidentally write in Christ after Jesus, or even intentionally just to be respectful to him. So later manuscripts are going to have the name Jesus Christ more often in biblical accounts than the earlier ones. So there are some additions like that as you get later on. But first of all, we can spot those. We know in most cases where it was added and not part of the original because we have so many early manuscripts. And that's the advantage of having all these manuscripts, is it gives us a very accurate picture of the original. But it's also fascinating that even over 1,400 years of copies, of copies, of copies, of copies being made, you really have a very small amount of additions. This is very accurate. Uh, there was great care made by those copying the manuscripts compared to other kinds of literature. There just is simply nothing like the New Testament out there uh, in terms of how accurate uh, of a recording we have of what the original writing said and that speaks volumes that God has preserved his word in history yes we might have a little debate over whether Romans 5 1 said um, we have peace or let us have peace but looking at the New Testament as a whole it is basically a miracle that we have a high degree of accuracy of our text of the New Testament all right, the New Testament has about a thousand times as many manuscripts as the typical classical author. In other words, there's really no comparison between uh, how much evidence we have of the original New Testament writings and any other ancient writing that we're comparing it to. There are 48 New Testament manuscripts that existed before the time of Constantine, and the Bible was not changed by him or fourth century Christians. What I'm talking about in this point is sometimes you'll see a social media post saying, well, Constantine invented Christianity or changed the Bible. Well, we have 48 copies of the New Testament from before the time of Constantine that testify to the fact that, no, the New Testament was the same before Constantine was born um, as it was after the time Constantine died. There's nothing changed. He couldn't go back and change all these manuscripts. We found manuscripts he wouldn't have known about. They're not changed. So those kind of claims are ignoring the actual physical evidence that the manuscripts of the New Testament provide. 
Uh, so we'll, we'll look uh, next time at our translations of the Bible. Uh, I will mention briefly right now critical texts. Critical texts are the work that is done by scholars to sort through all the manuscripts and then write one manuscript that we believe best represents the original autographs after studying countless manuscripts and comparing them and seeing which ones were written first and where they were written. And there are careful studies that result in a critical text. A critical text is a text that is meant to represent as best we can what was in the original autographs based on the cumulative study of all of these manuscripts. They are going to be the basis for Bible translations and that has some significant implications for how we understand our English translations today. We'll look at that next time.